Okay, so today we're going to be going over congenital heart diseases. Uh, the ones the NCCPA blueprint wants you to know for the pants are ASD, VSD, PDAs, coarctation of the aorta, and tetralogy of Fallot. So those are the five we'll be going over today. Again, this is from the cardiology section for the pants. Really quickly, I wanted to thank everyone for the comments, the likes. Um, I really do appreciate it. And um, lets me know that it's helping you, which is a huge reward for me. So if you are liking the videos, they're helping you. Please let me know in the comments and liking and subscribing. I'll be coming out with new videos pretty much every week now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing that I wanted to go over really quickly is cyanotic versus non-cyanotic conditions. So we can kind of understand that because you're going to see these, um, the different conditions we'll be going over today. So cyanotic conditions are when there is a defect in the heart and it's causing blood to shunt from the right side of the heart, which is non-oxygenated, moving to the left side of the heart, getting pumped out into the body. So you have this non-oxygenated blood getting pumped out into the body, which leads to cyanosis. So you're going to have this bluish discoloration of the body. And these patients are going to have this, um, this oxygen deficient blood getting out into their systemic circulation. This is what this looks like. So this would be an example of a VSD, but it can be an ASD or whatever the defect. You're having non-oxygenated blood from the right side of the heart moving over to the left and getting pumped out into the aorta, into the systemic circulation. So non-oxygenated blood contaminating the oxygenated blood uh, side of the heart and getting pumped out into the systemic circulation. Now on the opposite end, you have defects that can cause non-cyanotic conditions. So that's gonna be when blood from the left side, so oxygen rich, moves to the right side, gets pumped to the lungs. Not as big of a deal because you don't have that contaminated, um, non-oxygenated blood moving into the left, getting pumped down into the systemic circulation. So that's what this looks like here. Left side of the heart, you have oxygenated blood moving to the right side and then getting pumped into the lungs. But nothing is getting pumped out over here from the non-oxygenated side, so you're not having contamination here. And this all depends, whether it's a right to left or left to right shunt, on which side has higher pressure. Now, normally in a normal heart, it's gonna be the left side of the heart. It has, uh, that's the, the higher pressure side because it has to pump to the entire body. Um, so normally, unless you have some other defect to cause uh, higher pressure on the right, normally this side is gonna win because you have higher pressure here. But, um, in certain patients who have pulmonary hypertension or other problems or in tetralogy flow, some of the things we'll go over later, um, it can reverse and the pressure becomes higher here and pushes it over. And a condition known as um, Eisenmenger syndrome is actually when you have a, a left to right shunt, so a non-cyanotic, and over time, because all this extra blood in the right side of the heart that's getting pushed over from the left, is filling the lungs and eventually the lungs develop pulmonary hypertension. And all of a sudden you have this extra pressure on the right side. So the shunt can actually reverse and that's known as Eisenmenger syndrome. So Eisenmenger syndromes, when you add this pulmonary hypertension and things like that, that lead to a reversal of a, um, a left to right shunt to a right to left. So non-cyanotic to cyanotic um, shunting. So switching over and any of these non-cyanotic conditions can actually develop Eisenmenger syndrome. So just keep that in mind as well. And now, how do I know which is cyanotic, which is non-cyanotic? Well, I have a really good way. I didn't come up with this myself, but um, it's something that you should know in case you haven't heard of it yet. But anything that starts with a T is going to be cyanotic. Now, this part I came up with myself, but the uh, the actual starting with a T um, I did not, that's not mine, not original, but the turquoise I came up with, which I think is helpful. So if you ever see any of these conditions that start with a T, you should be thinking turquoise. And this is the color turquoise. I, I added turquoise color to all of these letters and turquoise is a bluish color. So when you have cyanosis, you have this turquoise color. Um, so if you see T, think turquoise and you know it's it's cyanotic condition. So any of these, truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great vessels, tetralogy fallot, which is the one we'll go over today. Any of these start with a T, it's a cyanotic condition. If it doesn't start with a T, it's non-cyanotic. So that's the easy way to remember it. If you see these congenital heart diseases, if it starts with a T, it's cyanotic. If it does not start with a T, it's non-cyanotic. So easy way to remember that. Okay, let's actually get into this now and we'll start going through each one of these. Okay, so atrial septal defect, just like the name implies, is a defect in the septum between the, the atrium. So it's an abnormal opening in the septum between the right and the left atrium. Now, does atrial septal defect start with a T? It does not. So it is a non-cyanotic condition. Always keep in mind, though, Eisenmenger syn uh, syndrome can develop. It can reverse. But this is just an abnormal opening between the septum, between the atrium. Um, now, this is what that actually looks like. So you have a hole here in the septum between the, uh, the atrium and blood is gonna be flowing typically, unless it reverses, from the left to the right side of the heart. So that's what that actually looks like. 
Now, normally, like I said, it's a non-cyanotic condition. Um, there are a few different types. Now, there's a lot of these that have different types. Don't remember all of them. I would just remember the most common type. So for ASD, the most common overall is going to be secundum ASD. And that is going to be the most common cause. About 70 to 75% of atrial septal defects are secundum ASD or ostium secundum. So a few other less common types, ostium primum, uh, coronary sinus ASD, which you can... Um, I would not remember those. I would just remember secundum ASD. That's going to be your most common type, and that's the one that you need to know. Now, clinical manifestations, as you'll notice with all of these, clinical manifestations are nonspecific for all of these um, diseases, all of these coronary or congenital heart diseases. Um, so don't go don't go too crazy memorizing the clinical manifestations. The physical exam is the part you really need to know. Now, clinical manifestations for ASDs, if they're small, they're not going to cause a lot of problems. Um, later on in adulthood, they can develop dyspnea, palpitation, syncope. It's even possible to develop emboli um, and have this higher potential for stroke risk. Now, physical exam, again, this is the important part. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to memorize for these because this is what's going to differentiate between them. Physical exam for atrial septal defect, you're going to have a systolic ejection murmur. It's going to be crescendo decrescendo, which means it's going to go up and then go down. And then it's best heard at the pulmonic area, which is the left upper sternal border. Now, if you ever forget where's the pulmonic, where's the aortic, where's the tricuspid, where's the mitral, et cetera, where's the herbs point, I have a way for you to remember it. And this is this is uh, the sentence that I remember. All patients eagerly take medicine. If you remember that, you can kind of look at your chest and think, all right, right side of the sternum starts with all patients eagerly take medicine. And that's aortic, pulmonic, herbs, tricuspid, and mitral. Just an easy way to remember the auscultation points on the chest, just in case you're uh, stressing out on an OSCE and you forget, you can quickly say that in your head and remember which point you're you're listening to when you're auscultating. Okay, so that's just a quick thing and you know for the auscultation memorization. Now the other thing, which is almost more important than the uh, the murmur that you're going to hear, is a wide fixed split S2. Now this is pathognomonic for ASD and it's really important for you to know. And if you don't remember or you can't remember too much about um, you know, the S2 sound and, and what's normal, what's not. Um, S2 is, is normally split, actually, and there's something known as physiologic splitting in about 90% of the population. So a split S2 is not abnormal. Now, a wide fixed split S2 is. So what happens with S2 is um, when you take in a deep breath, you're going to have um, all of this blood rushing back into the right side of the heart. So you have this increased um, venous return to the right side of the heart. And all this increased blood flows through the pulmonary valve, which de delays its closure. So the aortic valve closes first and then the pulmonic valve. And that's what you hear. And that's what the S2. And it's split because of that. So on inspiration, they're going to be split. And then normally on expiration, it's going to be the same. You're not going to see much of a difference. So you have this splitting um, on inspiration or S2 when you're going to hear this difference because all the blood coming back to the heart. Now, an atrial septal defect, if you remember, you have this abnormal opening in the septum, and therefore the atria is linked via the defect. So it doesn't matter whether you're taking in a deep breath, you're inspiring, or you're, you know, you're letting out a breath, the splitting is not going to ever change because the blood is being shared through both sides. So S2 is split the same during both S1 and S2, and it's considered fixed. So it's a wide fixed split S2 that doesn't vary with respirations. The way I remember this, hopefully this helps you, it, it helped me, um, is I remember atrial septal defect is the only congenital heart disease that starts with an A. And when I think of an A, I picture this. I picture somebody with their legs wide split, spread open doing like a wide split. It looks like an A. So you can see an A there and the, the split legs. So I think as soon as I see the A in atrial septal defect, I think of a wide split. And then I also think A in atrial septal defect stands for anchor, which is like a fixed. You can't move an anchor. It's like fixed in position. So that's how I always remembered atrial septal defect has a wide split fixed S2. Okay, so that's that. Um, let's move on to diagnosis. Again, this one is going to be common in all of the congenital heart diseases. You're always going to diagnose. Your best way to diagnose is going to be with an echo. So echocardiography. You can do chest x-rays. You can do EKGs. They're going to be nonspecific. Echo is going to be the way to diagnose all of these. So you remember one. You can remember them all. That's going to be your diagnosis. Again, you can do EKG. You can do chest x-rays but they're going to be nonspecific, just do an echo to diagnose these. Now, as far as treatment, again, this is another one that's going to be in common, which makes these easy to remember. Surgery is always going to be your definitive, your best um, treatment option. There are some other medicines and things like that, observation, but surger, surgical is always going to be your 
your definitive treatment. So treatment for this, again, observation, if it's small, less than five millimeters, um, or they're asymptomatic. And then thing is most atrial septal defects within the first year, um, close spontaneously. So a lot of times you don't have to have any form of intervention. They'll get, uh, they'll resolve within the first year. But if they're large, they're symptomatic, then you want to go ahead and do your definitive treatment, which is going to be surgical correction. So that's atrial septal defect. What do you need to know? Let's do the three things that I feel like you have to remember if you don't remember anything else. So atrial septal defect, obviously you have to know it's an abnormal opening between the right and the left atrium. You should know osteum secundum is your most common type. And then do not forget that it has a wide fixed split S2. As soon as you see that in any vignette, your mind should immediately go to ASD. Maybe it's something else that's causing it, but that should be your first thought because that's pathognomonic for ASD. So there's three things that I really feel like you need to know for ASD. Okay, so now moving on to the other side of the heart, the bottom of the heart, move on to ventricular septal defect. So very straightforward, just like atrial septal defect was a hole in the, the septum of the atrium. This is just a hole in the, the ventricular septum. So the bottom part of the heart, defect in the interventricular septum, and it's going to lead to shunting. And again, does ventricular septal defect start with a T? It does not, so it's non-cyanotic. Typically, if it's larger, it can lead to reversal of the shunt in Eisenmenger. I'm going to be repetitive with that, but I just want you to always remember that even though they're normally non-cyanotic, it can reverse. Okay, so that's what this looks like here. Very straightforward. You have the, the ventricles here. You have the septum. You just have a hole here. And again, this is the left side of the heart shunting over to the right and moving on to the right ventricle here. So that's your ventricular septal defect. Um, this you need to know. This is your most common congenital heart disease of childhood. You're going to be asked this at some point, whether it's on your boards, it's on an exam in PA school, um, one of your EORs, you'll be asked this. So what is the most common congenital heart disease of childhood? VSD, ventricular septal defect. I have a way to remember these at the end um, of this, but remember that this is the most common congenital heart disease of childhood. Now, the different types, again, don't remember all of them, but definitely remember your most common type. That's going to be perimembranous is your most common type, about 80% of VSDs in the U.S. Um, there's a few other less common ones, supercrystal inlet. This is what these look like here. So this is the one I told you is the most common the perimembranous, and then you have your different ones here. You have the uh, the supercrystal up here, all different types, but who cares? Don't remember those. You're not going to be asked that. That's just too much information. Just remember the most common, and that's perimembranous. Okay, now moving on to clinical manifestations. Again, these are all nonspecific, but let's just go over them anyways for the sake of completion. Um, so small VSDs may be asymptomatic. If they're a little bit larger, sometimes you'll have these frequent respiratory infections, maybe some fatigue. And then if they're large, like I said before, they can actually reverse. So the shunt can be reversed and leading to Eisenmenger syndrome, and then you have that cyanosis. On physical exam, this is what you need to know. Physical exam, you're going to have a high-pitched, hollow systolic which is like an even it doesn't go up it doesn't go down it's even all the way across the board hollow systolic murmur at the lower left sternal border so vsd high-pitched hollow systolic murmur at the lower left sternal border so diagnosis what do you think it's going to be echo so echocardiogram on all of these is going to be your diagnosis this is going to be the way you're going to diagnose all of them and again you can do an ekg or ecg that's going to be non-specific but it may show some left ventricular hypertrophy treatment again surgical is going to be definitive on all of these but if it's small you can observe and just like in asds it very well may um, close on its own within the first 12 months of life but if it doesn't or if it's larger and they're having some symptoms they're having some problems then you want to go ahead and do a surgical repair all right so how do you remember all the things we went over for vsd this is what i've come up with so ventricular septal defect vsd as soon as you see vsd you should remember very sharp dagger and what does a very sharp dagger do it chops a hole in your ventricular septum so you see vsd very sharp dagger chops a hole in your sept ventricular septum what does chop stand for common remember it's your most common congenital heart disease of childhood hollow systolic murmur and high pitched murmur you need to know that observation because in small vsds you're going to observe perimembranous your most common type and then surgery in moderate or large vsd so chops common hollow systolic high pitched observation perimembranous and surgery so as soon as you see vsd think very sharp dagger if you can remember that you can always remember it chops a hole in your ventricular septum and then just what does chop stand for and hopefully you can come to this here and remember that and that'll help you to get the question right okay so moving right along to tetralogy of fallot now this is our first cyanotic condition it starts with a t think turquoise 
turquoise is blue, cyanotic condition. So Tetralogy of Fallot starts with a T. It is a cyanotic condition. It's the only one that's included in the congenital heart diseases that the NCCPA blueprint um, wants you to go over that's included in that list. Now, it has four different defects in the heart. Um, and you need to know each one of those. So the four defects are going to be a right ventricular outflow obstruction. Sometimes this is known as pul uh, pulmonary valve stenosis because you can have pulmonary valve stenosis, but that's not the only thing that can cause the right ventricular outflow obstruction. So it's kind of incorrect. And if you look up, look at all the legitimate, legitimate sources, look it up today, you look at Pants Pearls, they're going to say right ventricular outflow obstruction rather than just um, pulmonary or pulmonary valve stenosis. Um, right ventricular hypertrophy, which is actually caused from the right ventricular outflow flow obstruction because the right ventricle is pushing hard to beat the uh, this outflow obstruction. What happens when the heart, heart works too hard and hypertrophy. So you're going to have right ventricular hypertrophy. Third thing, you're going to have an overriding aorta. The aorta actually shifts over to the right, which is going to be right over the ventricular septal defect. So let's take a look at what that looks like on a diagram. We can actually go over each one and we can talk a little bit about it just so you understand it a little bit better. Okay, so the, the first thing is that narrowing of the pulmonary valve, and that's your right ventricular outflow obstruction. So this can actually occur at multiple levels here, and it doesn't always have to be the pulmonary valve that's uh, obstructed or stenosed. Um, sometimes it can be these, um, these muscular bands that block the blood flow. Um, it can be the pulmonary valve in some cases, and some, sometimes the, the pulmonary valve is actually bicuspid in addition to being stenotic. And, um, you know, it's not really that important, but just remember that you have some form of obstruction in the, the right ventricular, you know, in the right ventricle. So some form of obstruction getting the blood out of the right ventricle. So the second thing, which is related to this um, obstruction here, is thickening of the wall of the right ventricle. This side of the heart is pumping hard to get through this obstruction, and it's going to hypertrophy. So that's what happens here. The, um, the third thing is the, the aorta is actually shifted over to the right. So the aorta should be right over here, right over the, the left ventricle here, receiving this blood. But it actually shifts, and it shifts over right over this ventricular septal defect, which you have in between the right and the left side of the heart. And just to go over really quickly why Tetralogy of Fallot is a cyanotic shunt, why you're having blood move from the right to the left instead of the opposite way, because remember what we talked about earlier with the which whatever side is, has the higher pressure is going to win and it's going to push to the other side. Now, normally I said the left side of the, the heart will have the higher pressure. But in this case, remember, because of this right ventricular outflow obstruction and the right ventricular hypertrophy, you have higher pressure over here now. So it's going to push through this VSD and move on to the left side. This blood's going to get pushed out into the systemic circulation. You have a cyanotic condition. So that's what's going on here. That's the four things in Tetralogy of Fallot. And again, I'll have a way for you to remember that later um, as we get towards the end of this. Now, risk factors, there's a few that you need to know. Um, Down syndrome is actually um, one of the more common ones that you can see with Tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, DeGeorge syndrome, which is going to be um, chromosome 22 deletion. And also another genetic disorder known as allogyle syndrome, which a lot of people might not be that familiar with. It's not as common as some of these, these other ones we talked about. Um, it affects multiple organs, but particularly the liver, can lead to bile buildup, but it's also seen um, as one of the disorders along with Tetralogy of Fallot. So remember that you can see any one of these um, in a patient with Tetralogy of Fallot. So remember that because it may be present in the vignette and you may need to know the association to help you come to the diagnosis. Now, clinical presentation. Of all of these, this is the only one I feel like there's an important part of the clinical presentation. So first of all, you know there's cyanosis. You know these patients are having that non-oxygenated blood getting out of the systemic circulation. So they're cyanotic. So their skin's going to be blue. Their mucous membranes are going to be blue. So you need to know that. But the important thing for, cyan for, uh, for clinical presentation is something, or actually, I'm sorry, tachypnea. Yeah, obviously. Um, you need to know TET spells. So what TET spells is, is going to be this transient occlusion of the right ventricular outflow, which leads to these severe sudden episodes of cyanosis. Um, normally it's going to happen when these children um, become agitated and are crying, but it can actually happen in older children as well, where they exert themselves. So they're exercising, they're playing sports, and then all of a sudden, they just turn blue. They have trouble. They're, they're cy completely cyanotic. And this is what they'll look like here. So this could be a child who all of a sudden starts crying and screaming is, you know, being fussy. And then all of a sudden they get this TET spell. So they have these, um, these 
obviously blue skins during crying and feeding. But like I said, it can happen in older children as well. And what happens in older children and in babies as well, um, there's this um, technique to improve the circulation. And what older children do will actually squat down. And sometimes it's a learned habit. They weren't taught this, but they know when they squat, they feel better. And in babies, what they do to improve the symptoms is actually push the legs in towards the chest. Now, why do you do this and why does it improve your symptoms? Well, when you have a um, right to left shunt, um, like it's going to be a cyanotic condition and you have this outflow obstruction that's making it worse during these TET spells. So when you squat or you push the legs towards the chest, you're actually increasing the peripheral vascular resistance. And what happens here is the left ventricular pressure actually rises. The left ventricle is pushing harder against all of these um all of these vessels in the lower legs that are actually being squished and compressed. So it has to push harder. There's more pressure on the left side. And what happens is, remember, whatever side has more pressure is going to win. All of a sudden, the left pressure temporarily rises and exceeds the right ventricular pressure, causing a temporary reversal of the shunt from a right to left cyanotic to a left to right non-cyanotic. So they have this temporary relief with their symptoms and it improves the tet spell and they start feeling a little bit better even if it's just temporarily so that's why they squat or you push the legs in to increase the resistance sh and uh shift the shunt from a uh, right to left to a left to right um to improve the symptoms so that's what a tet spell is you should know that i feel like that's the only clinical presentation that's important in all of these now physical exam again of course is going to be important and what you're going to hear is a harsh systolic ejection murmur and it's best heard at the left sternal border now you may wonder um you know why you're hearing this type of murmur like because they have a vsd so why aren't you hearing the vsd well the reason is because um the the murmur and the murmur you're actually hearing this harsh systolic ejection murmur is actually the the blood flowing um against the narrowed right ventricular outflow tract so that's what you're actually hearing that's the murmur of tetralogy of flow and the vsd is actually um, kind of drowned out by this murmur of the right ventricular blood flowing through this narrowed area through this outflow obstruction. So that's the murmur you hear in Tetralogy of Flow. You really don't hear the VSD. So all you're going to hear is this harsh systolic ejection murmur, which is going to be that blood flowing against that outflow obstruction. Now, diagnosis, again, of course, is going to be an echo. So you need to know that on all of these. And then you can also do um, an ECG as well. And chest x-ray. So chest x-ray is important for this one because it has one of those key terms that they might ask you about and they may describe in a vignette. So you're going to have a boot-shaped heart. And this is what it looks like. So you can actually see, I mean, it's very, a lot of times with x-ray findings, it doesn't look like what it says it is, but this literally looks like, if you look here, it looks like a boot or a shoe, um, just kind of looks like a big shoe or a big boot here. So that's what it looks like um, on an x-ray. And why does it look like that? Well, the heart is actually kind of turning up, it's upturned, and the apex is kind of pointing up. That, in addition to the um, the main pulmonary artery, is kind of concave in shape. So those two combinations of things actually form um, what looks like a boot shape on a chest X-ray. So remember that because it may be described. Again, the boards don't use uh, key terms, but they may describe something to describe how this appears here in the X-ray. So remember that if you do see that. Now, as far as treatment, you actually, uh, there's two things that you need to know. Obviously, surgery and all of these, but you also need to know a medication. So surgical repair is going to be your, your definitive, and you normally want to get it done within the first year of life. But the other thing, too, is prostaglandins. Alprostadil, um, I'm sorry, alprostadil in particular is going to be your first-line med. And this is to maintain patency of the ductus arteriosus, which improves circulation. Now, I'm not going to go too far into uh, PDA and what it is because we're going to go over that at the end. but just simply what you need to know is you want to keep the the ductus arteriosus open until you can have uh, these patients um, have surgery because that extra that vessel gives you another way for the blood to get out um, and into the lungs so it's just an extra way to improve circulation provides a secondary pass for a uh, path for blood flow um, since you do have this right ventricular outflow obstruction and blood can't get to the lungs easily, um, just provides additional pulmonary flow, improves O2 levels. So remember tetralogy of Fallot, in addition to surgery, to bridge them to surgery, to help them symptomatically until you can surgically repair it, you're going to do, um, you're going to give them prostaglandins. Alprostadil in particular is going to be the first line prostaglandin that you're going to give to them to improve this, um, this circulation for these patients. Now, 
this is what it actually looks like a PDA here. And in um, at, as a fetus, as an unborn child, this PDA actually helps um, the blood coming from the um, the uh, the right ventricle to bypass the lungs. So it actually comes from the right ventricle, shoots up here, and instead of going out to the lungs, it goes straight up into the aorta and gets out to the rest of the body because you don't need the oxygen. It's coming from the placenta of the mother. And that's because of the pressure also in the lungs. But when they're born, the pressure shifts, and this can actually provide another source for blood to come from the aorta into the lungs. So it's a secondary source um, in these cases. Don't go too crazy with the explanation. I'm sorry I went too far there. Just remember prostaglandins keep the PDA keep the PDA open, provide extra circulation for these patients in addition to surgery. Now, what do you need to know? Came up with a way for you to remember it. So remember, patients with tetralogy flow crave oxygen. They're cyanotic. They crave oxygen. So what does crave stand for? Cyanosis, because again, this is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. Not the most common congenital heart disease, but the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. Now, what does the R stand for? The R stands for the two things we went over, right ventricular hypertrophy. That occurs because of the right ventricular outflow obstruction. A stands for alprostadil, which is the first line prostaglandin to maintain that PDA. A stands for overriding aorta, aorta overriding. The V stands for VSD. So you have your four components there built into this mnemonic. And then E, echocardiogram test of choice. So as soon as you see tetralogy of Fallot, they crave oxygen. And then remember what CRAVE stands for. That'll give you um, your, your test of choice. That'll give you the four um, parts of this actual defect. And it also lets you know that it's the most common cyanotic heart condition, as well as the uh, one of the forms of treatment um, to maintain the, the PDA. So that's what you need to know for tetralogy of Fallot. We're only got a couple more here left. So coarctation of the aorta. Coarctation of the aorta does not start with the T, so it is non-cyanotic unless otherwise stated. So this is just a narrowing of the aorta, and it's typically located at the um, the insertion point of the ductus arteriosus. So where that that what we just went over that ductus arteriosus where it closes, it's normally right in that area, and it's normally just distal to the left subclavian artery, which is going to be important in a minute once I start going over the um, the physical exam findings. Now, this is what it looks like. This is a normal heart here. And then on the right here, you can see you have the aortic arch. Um, you have all your branches off here, the left subclavian there. And then here you have just this narrowed portion of the aorta, which can actually lead to a lot of problems we're going to go over in a minute. So all it is is just a narrowing, a coarctation of the aorta on the aortic arch there. Now, two important associated conditions that you do need to know that definitely may come up. Um, the first one's really important. So bicuspid aortic valve. You're going to see this in about 70% of patients, 70% of adults in particular, um, are going to have a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, so that's the most associated defect in adults. And the aortic, the aorta will have a bicuspid valve. And remember, the, um, the aortic valve normally has three leaflets. So patients with a bicuspid valve only have two. So remember that. You see this patient has a bicuspid aortic valve. You should be thinking, well, do they also have a coarctation of the aorta because those are uh, that's a very common associated condition. The other one is Turner syndrome. Um, and this, I, I do remember this coming up, I think in school. Um, so about 15% of patients with Turner syndrome will also have coarctation of the aorta. So that's really important to know. Definitely know those two for coarctation of the aorta. Um, clinical manifestations. Neonates may have, they may be asymptomatic, they may have poor feeding. Again, you see with all of these, they're kind of nonspecific. It's not very helpful. Um, and children, they may, it's a little bit different than the other ones, but so they may have some angina due to the decreased blood flow, trouble with the blood getting out of the aorta, um, cold extremities, and then claudication with physical exertion. So these, uh, these children will be exercising, and then all of a sudden they're going to have this cramping and, um, and pain in their lower extremities, which is just due to the decreased blood flow getting to that area. So that's something. And then in adults, um, hypertension is going to be the classic presentation. Is that specific? Of course not. Um, how many uh, older, you know, how many adults have hypertension? So not um, specific, but those are some clinical manifestations that you need to know. Um, now, physical exam. So this, I would say in PA school, of all the physical exam findings that you need to know, this is probably like in the top 10. So with coarctation of the aorta, you are going to have an extremely high yield finding. You're going to have hypertension in the upper extremities and relative hypotension in the lower extremities, which is also going to have a delayed or diminished pulse. So you're going to take your blood pressure in the upper arm. It's going to be, let's say, 140 over 90. You're going to do it in the leg, and it's going to be 
maybe like 90 over 80, maybe not that, maybe not that significant, but um, compared to the upper extremities, it's going to be lower. So whatever the blood pressure is in the arm, it's going to be much lower in the legs. And then as well, you'll do your, your radial pulse and you can do your popliteal and they're not going to happen at the same time. So the radial will hit first and then all, you'll feel the popliteal after or the dorsalis pedis, wherever you're measuring on the lower extremity. So remember that upper extremity hypertension, lower extremity hypotension with delayed diminished pulse. Now, why does it happen? If you understand this, it'll make more sense and it'll help you to remember it. So if you take a look at the aorta here, you can see the aortic arch. And what you have here, you have your right subclavian artery, your right common carotid, your left common carotid, and your left subclavian artery. Now, the right subclavian artery and the left subclavian artery provide blood supply to your arms. And that's important. The coarctation of the aorta typically happens right around here, past the left subclavian artery, which is obviously past the right subclavian artery as well. It's past all of these, these uh, branches. So it happens right around here. So right here, you have this coarctation and blood is having trouble getting past here. Now imagine, say you had a hose, you had two, you took a hose and you puncture, you puncture two holes in the top of the hose. You have blood flowing up out of those two holes and you take your finger and you pinch right in between those two holes. Now imagine, what do you think would happen to the first hole before your finger where it was pinched? Obviously that, that hole is gonna have more water flowing through because the water's kind of backing up. So you have higher pressure flowing through the first hole. Now think about the second hole, the one that's after where your finger kind of pinched down on the hose. What do you think is gonna happen to that pressure? It's obviously gonna be lower. Less water is coming through. You're gonna have lower pressure in that second hole. That's the exact same thing that happens here. You don't really have, it's not this complicated equation you need to figure out. It's just simply thinking about what's going on here. So you have a coarctation here. Everything uh, proximal to this point is going to have higher pressure. Everything distal to this point, like the lower extremities, is going to have lower pressure, less blood's coming through. And also it's going to be delayed because blood is having trouble getting through here. So it's going to be delayed. So that's why it happens. If you can figure it out in your mind, it makes a lot more sense and it'll help you to remember. Now you also may have a systolic murmur, but honestly, who cares? That is not important when you have something as high yield as this. So do not forget this. That's really important. Um, now diagnosis, of course, is going to be with an echo. Um, you can also do a CTMRA, but um, a CTMRA is often a complementary diagnostic tool. Um, it's in addition to an echo, um, normally used prior to, um, to surgical intervention for further anatomic data. So basically after you've established the diagnosis with an echo and you are going to surgically correct this condition, you can do a CTMRA to kind of plan out get a better idea of the anatomy of what's going on. Now, chest X-ray. So are you gonna diagnose a coarctation of the aorta with a chest X-ray? No. Do you need to know the chest X-ray findings for your boards? Yes, definitely. So the two things that you're gonna see on coarctation of the aorta in a chest X-ray, something known as posterior rib notching. So a posterior rib notching is, um, I'll take a I'll show you a, a diagram here um, or an X-ray. So sometimes you'll see this notching in the posterior portion of the rib. So you see this little notch here, here and right here. Um, so what happens there, you have these little carved out notches and it's caused from the increased um, arterial flow in the collateral vessels that overlie the bottom margin of the rib. So all that extra blood that's coming up, all that hypertension up in up here, you're gonna have this notching that's carved out. Don't worry so much about why it happens. Not gonna be asked that, but know that if you see something that says notching in the posterior, posterior ribs, that you should be thinking coarctation of the aorta. Now, the other thing, is known as a figure three sign. So quite simply what happens here, um, you have your aorta here. So normally this is your aortic arch. And because of the, the indentation of the aorta at the area of the coarctation, you have this area that comes in here. And then you have this post-stenotic dilation um, on x-ray. So it kind of looks like if you look here and here, you have a three. So that's your three sign on x-ray. So that looks like a three. You have this area here, the coarctation. Uh, post stenotic dilation, same thing going on here. Um, so a three right there, you can kind of look, visualize that and, and kind of see it in your mind there. Um, but that's what that is. So know those two signs because they may be mentioned in a vignette and you need to know, okay, they may be talking about coarctation of the aorta, probably are if you see that. Um, as far as treatment, now surgical correction is going to be your, um, your definitive way to, um, to treat coarctation of the aorta. 
But you should also know, just like in Tetralogy of Fallot, you may also give prostaglandins preoperatively, more of like a, a bridge again, just to maintain this extra. Um, so you just think of it as keeping like an extra vessel in the body so blood can get out. So you have any condition like these where blood's struggling to get out of the heart or, you know, further down, like in the aorta, you have this extra vessel that you can use. Why would you close it? So in newborns, if you find that they have a coarctation of the aorta, you give prostaglandins. Alprostadil normally is the one you'll use to maintain this extra um, blood flow. But surgical intervention is going to be your definitive. Okay, so what do you need to know? You do need to know that this is associated with bicuspid aortic valve and Turner syndrome. Remember those two. If you only remember one, remember bicuspid because that's the more common one. Um, you definitely, if you remember one thing of this whole presentation, remember this. Upper extremity hypertension and lower extremity hypotension. Remember that. And then, of course, on x-ray rib notching and a figure three sign. So you should know those two. All right, so let's do the last one. It's going to be a PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. So patent ductus arteriosus is a condition in which the ductus arteriosus stays open after birth. Now, normally within a couple days after birth, this is going to close. Um, and the purpose in a fetus of the ductus arteriosus um, is to um, allow blood to bypass the lungs while in the while. Uh, before being born, because when a, a when it's still in the, the fetal stages, it doesn't need the lungs to work. It doesn't need that oxygenation. It's actually getting um, oxygen from the mother's placenta. So there's no point of this blood going to the lungs for oxygenation. It's already getting oxygen. So what the, the ductus arteriosus does is it connects the, the fetal pulmonary artery to the aorta. So if we take a look at a diagram here, what happens is the right ventricle pumps and instead of this blood, this blood going out here in the arteries to the lungs, it's skipping and it's going straight up into the aorta and out into the body. So you have this blood that's already oxygenated. It has no point of going to the lungs. So it pumps and instead of going out into the lungs, it's going to go straight up. Now you might think, well, it's going up here and this is a small vessel. Why doesn't it still go to the lungs? Well, the reason is because in uh, as a fetus, the lungs actually have a high pressure. They're not filling with air. So they have high pressure. So you have high pressure here and here in the lungs. So where is it going to go? It's going to go to the area with lower pressure, which is in the aorta here. So that's why um, in the fetal stages, it goes here. And then later on, once they start breathing, um, you can maintain this and actually use it as a secondary source for blood to get to the lungs. When there's less pressure here, it'll start to go off this way. So it, that helps it makes a little bit more sense because before we talked about keeping the PDA open to get extra blood to the lungs, well, isn't that the point of this to skip it? Well, no, because once they're born, the lungs open, there's less pressure here. So it can actually um, escape through the aorta, come down here and go into the lungs. That's the idea. But uh, again, ductus arteriosus, the purpose is in the fetal stages is for blood to bypass the lungs and go straight out into the body because the blood's already oxygenated. But the problem with the PDA is these, these children are born and normally within the first couple of days, the, the ductus arteriosus closes and these patients does not, it stays patent or open. So patent ductus arteriosus, that becomes a problem. Now the epidemiology, there's a few things that you should know for this. Uh, first know that it is much more common in premature um, babies, prematurity. It also has a two to one female predominance. Um, in higher altitudes, because of the hypoxic state, the lower oxygen levels at higher altitudes, it's more common to see it in newborns born in higher altitudes rather than at sea level. And again, because of, because of the, uh, the hypoxic states. And then also congenital rubella. So remember that it's not that common, but it is something that very well may come up. So if you see congenital rubella, there is a chance that they may have a PDA. Now, patho, it's extremely simple. And I'm just going to have you think about it for a second. So what did we do to maintain the ductus arteriosus in the previous ones in um, Tetralogy of Fallot and things like that? How did we keep the ductus arteriosus patent? How do we keep it open? We gave them prostaglandin. So what do you think the problem is in a PDA? Well, they, these patients have this continued prostaglandin E1 production. It's not shutting off. And because of that, the PDA is it's staying open. The, the ductus arteriosus is remaining pat, patent. So that's what happens in these patients. So it's a really simple patho. Now, clinical manifestations, uh, they may have poor feeding, frequent lower respiratory infections. And again, remember, PDA does not start with the T, so it's non-cyanotic until, unless it's stated otherwise. And they may have some weight loss, so really non-specific cyanosis if Eisenmenger syndrome develops, but otherwise it's non-cyanotic. Now, physical exam, um, this one's very important. 
and I have a way for you to remember it. Hopefully this will be relevant to you. But continuous machine like murmur. Now, if, you, if you've already heard this or, you know, you've heard it in clinical rotations, you've heard it on your OSCEs um, or, you know, in labs, um, it literally sounds almost like a static, this continuous static noise and it's like a machine like murmur because it sounds almost like a washing machine noise and the way i remembered that pda has a continuous machine like murmur and hopefully some of you aren't too old to know what a pda was so pdas were palm pilots they were personal digital assistants um, and the way that i remember that as soon as i see pda patent ductus arteriosus i think of a pda personal digital assistant and this is just a little machine it's a little computer, a little machine. So I think PDA, I think of this PDA, and that helps me remember little machine and uh, continuous machine-like murmur. So hopefully that helps you. And then you also may have these bounding peripheral pulses. So the pulses are actually going to be stronger when you actually palpate these pulses. And then the other thing, too, that you're going to um, see in these patients with, on physical exam with a PDA is uh, wide pulse pressure. Um, so what pulse pressure is, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's the difference between your systolic and your diastolic blood pressure. So you subtract one from the other. Um, normally, anything over 50 is going to be a wide pulse pressure. So say, for instance, your systolic blood pressure is 120, your diastolic 60 the difference, the pulse pressure is going to be 60. That would be a widened pulse pressure. Um, so anything over 50, normally the normal pulse pressure is normally about 30 to 50. Anything over 50 is going to be a wide pulse pressure, which is what you'll see in patients with patent ductus arteriosus. Um, diagnosis, again, I'm sure you'd imagine this is going to be done with an echo. Um, you can also do an ECG, may show some left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement as well. But again, these are nonspecific findings. Echo is going to be the way you're going to diagnose. Now, treatment is interesting because um, surgical treatment is still definitive, so it's still going to be your definitive treatment, but this is the only condition that we'll go over that your first line or the first thing that you're going to try is actually a medication. And before I tell you what it is, I want you to think about this. So and we went over the patho. Um, you have a patient that has this increased prostaglandin production. So think of a medication that you know, a very common medication that inhibits prostaglandin. What inhibits prostaglandin production? It's NSAIDs. So NSAIDs is going to be your first line treatment. So ibuprofen, indomethacin. So those are the ones that used. Um, uh, those are going to be like your first line ones to use as far as NSAIDs. So you're going to try that first, normally for about 48 hours. And then you're going to do a repeat echo to see if the, the ductus arteriosus has closed, to see if the PDA is no longer there. If not, then you're going to have to go ahead and do a surgical correction. Um, there's a few different options. There's surgical ligation, percutaneous catheter occlusion, um, a few different ways to close this. But um, that's only if they're non-responsive to NSAIDs, which a lot of them do respond to NSAIDs, and it go ahead, it closes once you inhibit that prostaglandin, and then it's no longer an issue. So what do you need to know for PDA? You definitely need to know that this is caused from continual prostaglandin E1 production. Um, you have to know this is a continuous machine like murmur and auscultation. Remember, personal digital assistant, little machine. And then remember that NSAIDs are going to be your first line treatment. Of course, definitive is surgery, but NSAIDs are first line. That's the first thing you'll try. Okay, so we are done. Let's just do a few questions to see what you've retained. Um, hopefully, you'll get all five right, but let's see. So what is the most common type of congenital heart disease? Most common type of congenital heart disease. That's your ventricular septal defect. Remember, VSD, very sharp dagger, is going to chop your ventricular septum. And what does the C and CHOP stand for? Common, most common congenital heart disease. What are the four abnormalities seen in Tetralogy of Fallot? Four abnormalities. So that is going to be right ventricular outflow obstruction or the pulmonary, the pulmonary stenosis. Um, it's going to be right ventricular hypertrophy, VSD, as well as an overriding aorta. And if you remember, um, for tetralogy of flow, patients with tetralogy of flow crave oxygen. Remember, crave. This is all in, as part of that that word crave. Remember, the R stands for right ventricular outflow obstruction. Right ventricular hypertrophy, the V in crave stands for VSD, and then the A stands for the aorta overriding. So that's how you remember those. Um, describe the murmur in patent ductus arteriosus. Hope you remember that because we just went over it about like 30 seconds ago. So that's machine, a continuous machine-like murmur. Remember PDA, personal digital assistant, little machine. That's your machine-like murmur. Um, describe the potential findings on a chest X-ray in a patient with a patent ductus arteriosus. So what are the potential findings 
Okay, so now that I'm reading this out loud, I realize the qu the question I'm supposed to be asking here. So, what are the potential findings on a chest X-ray in a patient with <clears throat> coarctation of the aorta? So, disregard this. Just like don't even think about. It. So, describe the potential findings on a chest X-ray in a patient with coarctation of the aorta. And on coarctation of the aorta, you're going to see posterior rib notching, and you're going to see a figure three sign. So. Potential findings in a chest x-ray in a patient with coarctation of the aorta. Sorry, I wrote the wrong thing here, but just remember it's coarctation of the aorta. You'll see posterior rib notching and figure three sign. Disregard what that says there. And the last question, what is the most common type of atrial septal defect? Most common type of atrial septal defect is going to be ostium secundum. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. Um, if it is helping you, please let me know in the comments. Please like, subscribe, um, shoot me a comment. Let me know if it's helping you. I really do appreciate those. And that kind of keeps me motivated to keep this up because it is definitely a lot of work. But, um, you know, hearing that it's helping you guys keeps me going and, and keeps me making these. So um, thank you again. Good luck on your pants, your pandery, your EORs, and good luck in PA school.